what we are going to do something really simple in this paper. Uh, we are going to construct these volatility managed portfolios. These portfolios are just, we are going to just get, you know, these well known aggregate asset pricing factors and scale them by, you know, a measure of volatility. Okay? And that's all. These portfolios are going to take more risk when volatility is low and take less risk when volatility is high. And the motivation is straight out of the most simple portfolio choice problem that you can write. That is, if you, if you can you know, basically predict the risk return trade off, then you should invest more on, a, on, on disaggregate portfolio when this risk return trade off is more attractive. As it's well known, you know, there's a very weak relationship between you know, expected return and volatility in the time series. So it's almost like, uh, it almost has to be that volatility timing is beneficial. So we are just going to you know, apply these ideas to the data and turn out to be you know, very much true. You can, get in, you can enhance uh, sharply uh, the sharp ratios relative to a buy and hold portfolio. Okay? So in particular, you're going to you know, generate large alphas relative to the original factors. And what's puzzling is that you're typically going to take less risk in periods that are kind of scary. That is, you're going to have high alpha by taking less risk when, you know, in recessions, when volatility is high. You're going to sell after market crashes when typically you think you know, premiums are very high and it's probably a bad idea to be selling. Our strategy is going to do exactly that, do exactly this dumb thing that you saw your, you know, your family doing or you know, some endowments doing, but nevertheless, the, this, this portfolio is going to do well. And the, the, the key is that it comes back in once volatility comes back to normal. Okay? So what I'm going to do is basically you know, spend most of the talk in these volatility managed portfolios and talk about what they are, how they work. And then I'm going to think about you know, the portfolio choice implications <coughs> of this, both for short term invariance investors as for long horizon investors. And then I'm going to very briefly think about you know, what's the implication of general equilibrium, because obviously not everybody can volatility time, but probably I'm not going to spend much time here. Okay? So uh, the data, you know, there's no data collection <laughs> uh, effort involved in this exercise. The most standard data that you can imagine of, and you can, you can you know, download or basically ask this data to anybody. And the, the key constraint is that we need daily data to construct our measures of volatility. Okay? And all the numbers that I'm going to report is going to be annualized numbers. Okay? So, okay, so what do we do? I mean, that's basically the paper. <coughs> we go get your favorite asset pricing factor, and you could even think as a combination of asset pricing factors that you think you know, span the, the, the mean variance frontier. And then we are going to you know, construct this measure of uh, previous month realized volatility. So at, this is a day thing that's measured at time t. So we just go there. There's no you know, parameter estimation involved. You just go construct the, the measure, you know, using past da daily data, you construct a measure of realized volatility. And then you you're going to be constructing this volatility managed factor out of the original factor. The only thing here is that we use this C here to basically normalize the volatility of these two portfolios. That's just for interpretation. Okay? That is so that the volatility of this portfolio is equal to that one. But that doesn't have any effect on sharp ratios. It's just so that the alphas are you know, interpretable. Okay? And then what we're going to do is this you know, standard regression. And then we're going to be looking at these alphas here. That is, how much higher sharp ratio can, can we get by, uh, by engaging this timing strategy? And I'm going to discuss you know, what's the later what's the economics of that. Why we exactly, how exactly we are, we are getting this alpha. Okay? So here is our, basically our main table. You have, you know, here's the volatility managed factors. So here we are going to be doing individually. La later we are going to go to the multi-factor approach. And then what you see, you know, you always have kind of a lower beta, okay? That is, you have, you know, you always uh, uh, kind of reducing your exposure relative to the original uh, factor, and you are, and you always uh, have, uh, you know, mostly have, you know, high alphas besides, you know, the the S and B that has a, a, a negative uh, negative alpha, okay? Uh, <coughs> but you know, the S and B doesn't have, a, you know, a positive expected return in the sample uh, anyway, so. It's not clear what to make of that. But you see, you know, for example, for the alpha, you have, for, for the market, you, know, you have something like uh, the market during this period had an excess return of s uh, about 8%, a little bit less than that. And you have an alpha of almost 5%. So it's like 
is uh, relatively speaking is a huge alpha, especially because it's a very you know is basically an aggregate portfolio, right? That's relatively easy trade, not for you know the Norway sovereign wealth fund, obviously. But uh, and that you know that holds you know true for all the other factors. For some of them are you know this is gigantic. You know for momentum you have these gigantic alphas. And by the way, this you know uh, this fact here has shown up in other papers. For example, uh, Moskowitz and and Ken De uh, Toby and Ken and Ken Daniel have have a paper that you know show uh, something uh, closely related to this fact here. Okay. But, but that's also holds true also for you know carry trade and you know across the uh, the borders <coughs> these asset pricing factors. Okay, so and what's the economic meaning of this? Well, you can start thinking about you know, you know just from the perspective of an individual portfolio, how much he can basically increase his Sharpe ratio. So it's basically you know the the alpha divided by the residual risk, and you know it's. Uh, you know, this is a fairly big numbers. You know, for the markets, like you know, 0.33 relative to a sharp ratio of 0.42 in the in the in the sample. Okay, for momentum, it's, it's you know uh, really really big. Okay, but you know, it's by and large you know uh, very large you know appraisal ratios. Uh, but you might think, well, we live in a kind of multi-factor world. We know that the CAPM does not work, and a lot of investors, while some investors can only invest in the market. Other investors have access to other factors. So what's the right thing to do there? How to think about these facts? Uh, so then what we, what we do, we apply you know, exactly this idea to like this static MV portfolio. Now think about a buy and hold investor that chooses his portfolio optimally. He's going to choose this, you know, this uh, MV portfolio. Obviously here we're going to be doing in sample MV portfolio. So you have to take you know, the buy and hold sharp ratios with a huge grain of salt. But then what we're going to apply, we're going to do volatility managing on this MV portfolios. In that, there's not going to be any issues involved because we're just going to do this bread and butter uh, trading strategy that takes more risk when volatility is low. Okay? And then what we do, we go and you know, br you know, slowly spend the investment opportunity set. Or if you're an asset pricer, you might think that you're, you, know, you might not believe that momentum is really there. And you might think that you, know, you should stop at Fama French 3. Okay? So it depends on what's your vision of the right you know, factor model, what's the right you know, uh, 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 proxy for the, the mean variance frontier in the economy. You might going to be thinking about these uh, different columns here. But then what you see is like, Across the board, you always get you know, uh, very large alphas and very large appraisal ratios. Right? So the right way is the sharp ratio is the sharp ratio of the original buy and hold portfolio. And the appraisal ratio is you know, the, the, basically the extra uh, bit that the volatility management strategy is producing. Okay? So, uh, and obviously this is economically important, not only from an from individual perspective, but also you know, from you know, asset pricing because this these factors have you know, a lot of information about a large cross-section of assets. So what this is telling you is that a strategy that takes more risk when volatility is low make high alphas, lar make large alphas, what is going to uh, say something about compensation for risk in the economy. Okay? So let me just like, open up a little bit what's going on very mechanically here. We can, also, we can always decompose the alpha in two bits. Okay? This first bit here is due to volatility timing. So that is to the extent that you can basically shift your average beta relative to the unconditional beta that's going to be picked up by this term. Okay? And this other, per this other piece is like, if you know the work of Jagannath and Wang, that's the, you know, it's going to be measured ma market timing. Okay? So if the risk return trade off is strong, that is, re expect returns line up with, with variance. Then the alpha is going to be basically zero because these things are going to offset each other. That is, you might volatility time well, but expect returns are just like you know uh, get, getting back all the gains that you have. So these things are going to cancel out, and you're going to get the alpha of zero. But if vol does not forecast returns, as is basically true in the data, then you're going to get uh, all these pieces alpha. And note here that even if vol uh, predicts returns somewhat, you can still get a positive alpha. So it's not, you know, you had, you know, this previous literature was focused on the fact, is the risk return trade off is there or not there? But that's not the relevant question to ask. The relevant question to ask is that strong enough? As long as it's not strong enough, you can, get, you can benefit of volatility timing because the risk return trade off is moving in an attra attractive way when the vol is low. And you can, you can see that very clearly, for example, for the market portfolio. So here's kind of like a non-parametric version of the strategy or a firma French 
style of showing stuff, you basically what we do here is sort you know, uh, uh, months by their realized volatility and, and bucket them in five bins according to you know, the level of the month volatility. And then we look next month what happens with returns and what happens with volatility. You see the relationship is basically flat on returns, okay? That's probably not surprising. You, you know that it doesn't predict well returns. Uh, and while the you know, previous month volatility predicts uh, next month volatility well. Now, but you know, for, for an investor, and people have focus on this thing, okay, it goes up here, here's flat, okay, there's no risk return, but this is hard to estimate and so on and so forth. But you know, for, for an investor that's deciding how much to invest in the, in the portfolio, he actually cares about the effective risk aversion, that is expected returns that are divided by variance. And that's sharply negative, okay? So this is a strong signal that you should be taking more risk when vol is low and less risk when vol is high. It's also true for the sharp ratio, but people often focus on the sharp ratio, but that's not really the right quantity if you're deciding uh, how much to, uh, to allocate between these two assets. In this case, it's really the risk return trade-off. And that's very, very sharply negative. And that's what the paper is, okay? So we look at this result of several angles, okay? I'm, I'm gonna just discuss two of them here. But we show that, you know, in fact, this takes much less risk in recessions. It's gonna survive, you know, transaction costs. This works with embedded leverage, so you can use, you know, uh, call, uh, call options to implement this type of strategy if you don't have access to internal leverage. You, you know, uh, we, we look at different subsamples and see what happens. It's somewhat weaker, you know, during in the, this middle period. Uh, we, we, it, the results can be further improved if you are willing to estimate a model for volatility. We are not estimating any model, so, you know, we cannot, there's nothing to discuss in terms of like, you know, overfitting or anything because there's no parameter being estimated. So, but you can estimate parameters and do stuff even better, but then we would have to defend myself here. So we look at, you know, uh, uh, internationally and stuff works as well. We look at, you know, across uh, multiple uh, uh, factor controls and especially we focus on this, uh, you know, there's well known in the literature, there is this low, uh, low uh, risk anomaly in the cross section, right? So one might think that you know, this low risk anomaly in the time series that we are exploring is similar to the cross-sectional one, but you know, they you know, turn out that you know, at least by you know, uh, standard regression tests, they don't seem to be capturing the same thing. And by the way, you can actually volatility time even these cross-sectional anomalies, okay? So you, it works there as well, okay? And you might be worried that we are gonna be, because we're doing a dynamic, stra dynamic strategy, we might be generating put-like returns, or option-like returns, but we show in the paper that you know, uh, 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 the, our search has very well behaved returns and we go through a battery of tests to show that you know, it, it doesn't seem that this thing uh, you know, is trading like uh, uh, put option sell. In fact, you know, after uh, you know, a bad month, this strategy is gonna take less risk, okay? So it's kind of the opposite of a, of a put option, okay? But, and we show that you know, our chart is actually less exposed to variance risk that you might think that's, you know, because we're trading volatility, it might be an issue, but we actually, you know, because vol vol is high, when vol is high, our strategy actually takes less vol risk than, uh, than the buy and hold portfolio, okay? So let me show just, you know, the recession results and the transaction cost results. So what you see here, you know, here I'm, I'm letting the beta vary by, you know, if the economy is in recession uh, period. And you see that on average our strategy has a, a beta of 0.8, but if you condition a recession, the, this beta, you know, falls to 0.8. So you're taking much less risk during, you know, scary times, you know, at least as judged by, you know, how we think about uh, how asset pricers think about uh, compensation for risk, okay, what it makes this puzzling. So our strategy does trade quite a bit. So because, you know, realize we are trading on realized volatility, so realized volatility, is, you know, moves a lot. So here, here's the absolute value of the trading, so that means that on average, you're churning 70% of your portfolio every month, so it's a lot of churn. Uh, what we do here, we calibrate using uh, kind of an AQR white paper where they use you know, their data to estimate transaction costs. And you know, our strategy, you know, uh, basically, you know, here's the, you know, the upper bound of what they think is plausible in a high VIX month. And nevertheless, our strategy survives. 
but you can further improve just by, for example, if you use a model of expected volatility, you can reduce this churn substantially, cut by half, or you can even like, you know, just trade when the stuff above the mean. So if you're actually a practitioner, you can basically, you know, you know uh, play with this to, to reduce substantially your exposure to transaction costs, okay? So you might be thinking, well, what, what's going on? We know that, you know, in recessions, our expected returns are high. There's a lot of literature on that. What's going on? So to get a little bit of sense of the dynamics of what's happening in the data, we are going to do a, you know, a vector autoregression uh, in order to, to see how, that, how volatility and expected returns interact. Okay? So what I want to point you out here, look at this middle, uh, middle picture here. So this is basically you know, uh, almost by construction. That's like how volatility responds to a, to a volatility shock. So a one certain deviation of volatility shocks goes up and then goes down, and by 18 months, it basically went away. Right? Expected returns, on the other hand, initially do not respond. And then they slowly respond and they stay high for a while. That shouldn't be surprising. We know the expect return shocks are very, very persistent. But you know, what this is telling you is that basically you can cash out when there is a volatility shock and comes back, come back in and expect returns going to be, still be very high. So there's a mismatch between you know, risk and, and compensation for risk in the time series. Uh, why is that? Maybe some people are low moving. We, we, you know, uh, we, we don't have an answer for that, okay? So, okay, I have uh, four minutes probably. So first I'm gonna talk about, uh, you know, what does it mean in terms of like a utility benefit for a mean variance investor. So basically, you know, just using the appraisal ratio, you can get, you know, that a mean variance investor can basically increase his certainty equivalent by 65%. That is, if he has a 10% return, he can increase this return for to 16.5% basically from that. Just to have a sense of magnitudes, the expected return time in regression that uses actually uh, uh, numbers based on forecasting R squares that have all the issues with you know, overfitting have like a 35% gain. So it's like uh, almost twice that, okay? So it's kind of large. And this works for many factors beyond the aggregate market. While if you're gonna do the expected return timing, you have to use different factors for different, uh, uh, different uh, predictions for different factors. I mean. <coughs> I love the expected return time in literature. I'm just like giving like a con contrasting point, okay? Uh, but you might think that, well, what should a long, long horizon investment, uh, long horizon investor should do? Should he really time volatility? For example, Buffett and Cochrane had up ads during the fall of 2008 saying no, that that's a bad idea. Investors should ignore short run volatility in stock markets, okay? And then that might be that, you know, all we are doing here is really stupid for a long run investor, okay? Uh, so we are going to be thinking, and how portfolio theory thinks about that, it thinks in terms of hedging demand. That is, a long-term guy is going to have you know, some hedging demand to the extent that shocks are mean reverting. Okay? So what we are going to think, and here's the intuition. You know, if you live to, to here and you have a shock that does that, if vol goes up, you couldn't care less. Okay? So if you trade on this, you're just going to be actually making your, uh, your wealth, final wealth more volatile. Okay? So you probably don't want to do that. Empirically, these shocks are very, very slow, okay? So the private price dividend ratios are highly persistent, sharp ratios increase very, very slowly with the horizon, and there's tons of cash flow shocks. So in the end, it's a quantitative question. You know, is it true that they should do or shouldn't do? Okay, we, we can't say just a priori, okay? So what we do is set up this portfolio problem that is fairly standard up to 0.4. We are gonna allow volatility to move around, expect returns to move around. But what's going to be important to capture you know, Cochrane Buffett intuition is that we're going to have to allow the composition of the discount rate shocks and cash flow shocks to vary. And that's something that hasn't been in the literature and turned out to be essential to at least get, you know, make their intuition work. Okay? Just the fact that returns mean revert do, is, are not sufficient to say that longer run investors shouldn't trade on that. Okay? So in fact, you know, what we show that uh, here, you know, it, it, it's a simplified version that the weights can be written as, you know, the myopic weights plus this hedging demand that depends on the ratio between the, the, the amount of discount rate volatility and the amount of total volatility. So, and here's intuitive, if suddenly there's more discount rate volatility going on, relatively speaking, the stocks are safer for a long run investor. So what you require to get their intuition is that this thing is moving around, okay? But we don't know in the data. That's just an empirical question. We don't know. We know that expected returns seem to move around, 
but we don't know if the volatility of the expected returns move around relative to the volatility of returns. That's a you know empirically challenging thing. So, but then what we're gonna do, uh, you, you know, you can approximate this by this very simple uh, function here. That's basically uh, an intercept and this coefficient here that basically captures how much volatility timing you do. Okay, so if you're a mean variance or log, your b equals one. So that's relatively the level that we're going to be thinking about. If you have, if the Buffett uh, Cochrane conjecture uh, holds, then b equals zero. Okay, so what we do, we're going to see what happens in the data. So we calibrate uh, this to uh, to the data for the market portfolio, and, and and then evaluate three cases. One is that when the discount rate, cash flow, uh, volatility mix is constant. That's basically the standard. Uh, assumption in uh, the whole literature because we can't measure, so we assume it's constant. And then we are going to basically uh, think about if what, uh, what if, is the, if there's a higher share of cash flow vol uh, when volatility goes up or a higher share of discount rate vol. And here's what we find. If the, it's the, in, in the standard case, then the buy and hold, the long-term investor should behave exactly as the mean variance investor because it's true that he holds up, on average, he holds a bigger position on the risky asset, but he's going to respond just the same to volatility. So, and then, so in this case, the standard case, the intuition, it doesn't hold. You should just trade exactly like the mean variance investor. If it's mostly about cash flow volatility, that is, you know, in the 4,000 rate, we truly thought that the 8% VIX was about, you know, the fate of the US economy in the long run, then the long run investor should actually trade more aggressively on, on, on vol. While if you think you know, the fall of 2008 was about bankers risk aversion shifting very quickly, then they should trade less aggressively. But nevertheless, even if you have a fairly long horizon, I don't know the horizon of the you know, Norway sovereign wealth fund, but even in this case, you, should, uh, you, know, you, should, you still can benefit of volatility time. Okay? Uh, all right, of course, you know, and here's summing up this, of course we don't have, you know, not everybody can volatility trade, so I'm going to skip that. So you know, the, the conclusion is you know, we, we show very large alphas for this very simple strategy. And this has very, uh, generate very uh, big gains in utility. And as I didn't discuss, this, uh, you know, it poses a general equilibrium puzzle in the, in the sense that the price of risk is low and volatility is high.